بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome everybody to the Nothing But Facts Safina Society, the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream on a Tuesday which is gray it is a bit cold in the great state of New Jersey in the United States of America one of the greatest states to live in uh, awarded this three years running by the U.S. News and World Report. Because of the two big cities, New York and Philly's right there, we got an international airport that's so cozy and small and easy to deal with. We got the beach. We got the mountains. We got the hood. We got the burbs. We have everything in the great state of New Jersey. And so that's why uh, people... We got the biggest state college in the entire country, population-wise. We got one of the biggest medical schools and medical uh, uh, and university hospitals okay we got an ivy league school okay there's everything mashallah in this state it's one of the best states to live in okay uh now let's today what are we doing today we have a wonderful guest i'm sitting there about five years ago in medina and Munawwara on my last day there under those beautiful canopies and waiting for ishraq to come in as you know from the great sunan that we should try to practice, especially when you go to Umrah and Hajj, is to pray Fajr in the Jama'ah. And if you're in Umrah and Hajj, you're usually going before the Adhan of Fajr. Can't miss that. Wait, pray Fajr. Wait until the sun is up a little bit. Put your spear in the ground and see where the sun is because that's what they used to do in the old days. But now our shiuch teaches to count 20 minutes after Ishraq. Then you pray two rakahs, and then you have the, the reward of hajj and umrah fully complete. Okay? You get the reward of that. Without it removing the taklif of doing hajj if you haven't done it before. I'm sitting there, and I get approached by a young sheikh. And I look, and we start talking. And we ended up talking maybe 35, 40 minutes. We ended up talking about one of the, great, the, the, the best books in refutation of Shia. And the power of this refutation, the depth of knowledge, the author of that book really is something else. So my guest today who will be discussing this, and essentially the essence of it is that uh, showing that Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, Sayyidina Aisha possess all the signs of believers and none of the signs of hypocrites, as is levied upon them. I felt you would all benefit from this, and that's just the opening of our discussion. We'll let the discussion go where it goes after that. All right, let's bring to the program Sheikh Muhammad Yasir al-Hanafi out of Birmingham, England. Sheikh Muhammad, welcome to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi. So let's go straight, let's get straight to it. Uh, begin with one of the proofs and expounding on the thesis uh, that the Quran clearly shows there are signs of hip, of the hypocrites around the Prophet and there are signs of believers and the two never mix. Yeah, so bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First and foremost, jazakumullah khairan, uh, Dr. Shahid al-Masri. Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum, my pleasure. Yeah. Want to accept your efforts and may Allah accept Ameen. Ameen. whatever you and your friends and teams may Allah give them all jazakh uh, khair inshallah. Amin, amin. The the topic that we discussed, Alhamdulillah, initially in Medina Munawwara. Uh, this is, I would say, in my humble opinion, a revolutionary discussion that took place a uh, few decades ago, and it's important to give a backdrop of what happened, uh, the historical context is important before we start discussing the actual uh, discourse. So this was, uh, now I'm just um, recalling from my memory. So I might be uh, in uh, somewhat inaccurate in some of the things I say, but the general picture inshallah should be accurate. This was approximately in 2018 or 2019 or even slightly before, we had a three days course in Manchester. Uh, with Dr. Allama Khali Mahmoud, rahmatullahi alayhi, who passed away a couple of years ago in Ramadan. And uh, 
these three days course, it was regarding Mi'yari uh, Sahabiyat, the criterion of being a Sahabi. What makes a Sahabi? Uh, what are the conditions of being a Sahabi? So this particular discussion occurred in those three days. And I vividly remember uh, this discussion because it was auspicious gathering. It was a spiritual lifting gathering. And subhanAllah, it was absolutely amazing. So the backdrop to this is that Sheikh uh, Khali Mahmoud alayhi, said in the 80s or early 90s, there was a Shia cleric in Pakistan who gave a speech. And this speech was broadcasted on radio. It was also then uh, penned and written in a small uh, treatise document and then distributed amongst the Sunni population of Pakistan. And the synopsis or the summation of what he said was as follows. That Shia are Muslim, they are oppressed in Pakistan. And the reason is that when it came to making Pakistan, Shia and Sunni were together. They were united, which is true. When it came to declaring the Qadiani uh, sect, Qadiania, who follow Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, the Shia and Sunni were together in declaring them disbelievers, kuffar. So in major events through different interval of times, the Shia and Sunni in Pakistan uh, historical context, they were together. Now there's a great division, there's a great divide amongst the Shia and Sunni. And the reason to this is because the Sunni say that we don't believe in the Sahaba. The Shia is saying this. And he says, by Allah, ye jood hai, ye jood hai, ye jood hai. this is a lie, this is a lie, this is a lie. We believe in Sahaba. Sahaba to hamare sar ki taj hai, meaning they're the crown of our heads. Unke juto ke niche jo matti hai, the dust underneath their feet. Ham to usko surma banani ke liye tiyar hai. We are ready to make the dust on, uh, that is found under their feet as kohal, as a uh, antimony, antimony, you know, uh, kohal. Kohal, yeah. So everybody's listening to this and, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't look like a Shia is speaking. Because he's saying Sahaba are great people. We are, they're the crown of our heads. We are willing to make the dust under their feet, kohal and antimony of our hearts. But then he started injecting his poison. He said, we, hum sirf Makkah ke daku ko nahi mante. we only reject the highway robbers of Makkah. Mm. Now, you and I know, who he is indicating towards the issue of Khilafat, etc. But he is clearly not saying Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma name because if he does, <laughs> it's game over, especially in Pakistan. So he just gave this hint. And then he said, well, ye to Quran ki baat hai. this is what I'm saying is in the Quran. We believe the Sahaba to be the believers, the mu'minun. And this is a Quranic discourse, is a Quranic fact. If you open Surah Baqarah, the first 20 verses, the first five verses are uh, dedicated to the believers. Yes. Uh, verse number six and seven is to do with the kuffar. And then from Wamin and Nasi Man Yaqul till the end of the Ruku' is to do with Munafiqeen. Mm -hmm. And just a side point here, our teacher said that if you analyze this first Ruku' the long, uh, longest verses or the most verses are to with the munafiqeen, meaning we should refute them extensively. So he said, these are three groups, the Shia is saying. You have the believers, mu'minun, mm. you have the kafirun, the mm. disbelievers, and you have the munafiqun. So when it comes to sahaba, we believe the mu'minun to be the sahaba, not the munafiqun. And even the Quran says, that the munafiqun used to say the kalima, they would assent to the shahada, but they didn't believe in it. When the munafiqun come to you, O Prophet, they say, We give, uh, we bear witness that you are the Prophet of Allah. And Allah knows that you are his Prophet. 
wallahu yashhad innal munafiqina lakadhibun an allah bears witness that the munafiqin are lying so the shia says we believe the sahaba but we believe the mu'minun to be the sahaba not the munafiqun and the munafiqun would say the kalima and this is in the quran so this sent a lot of confusion in the Sunni population especially that, you know, these Sunni clerics that are refuting the Shias, uh, these people are fine, they believe in the Sahaba and they have given, uh, he has said something which cannot be disputed, you know, it is like kalimatu haqqin urida bihal batil. So the statement in and, it's, in and of itself is true, but the intention behind this statement is false. So anyway, this was the khulasa, the summary of his speech. And many people were influenced. He also, then his speech was compiled into a small booklet or treatise and it was distributed. And the name of this book was Mi'yar al-Sahabi, the criteria of being a Sahabi from the Quran, which is that you have to have, be a believer. Now, what this person did, he subtly uh, uh, attacked the Iman and the faith of Abu Bakr and Umar anhuma, without mentioning their name, without using any definitions. Uh, down here, he used the Quran. This booklet, this treatise was taken to uh, Dr. Allama Khalil Mahmoud rahimahullah, and it was shown to him. So he said, I read this work and I said, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. That this is such a obfuscation and mughalata that for many years I've been debating the Shias, but hitherto I have not come across such an obfuscation and such a mughalata where the Iman of Abu Bakr and Umar have been attacked without mentioning their name, using the Quran. So now his task was to defend the Iman of Abu Bakr and Umar, but the epistemic method has to be the same which is the Qur'an. So you can't say, for example, uh, uh, Imam Qadi Iyad rahmatullahi alayhi gives this definition of a Sahabi, or mm -hmm. Imam rahmatullahi alayhi gives this uh, definition, or this Imam postulates this definition. The epistemic uh, method has to be the same, which is the Qur'an. So he says, for many months, I couldn't answer, and it was difficult. I used to make dua to Allah, do Allah. You know, if your Imam Razi was alive, he would have answered. If your Shah Waliullah was alive, you know, he would have answered. But your weak servant, Khalid Mahmood. SubhanAllah. How am I going to answer this? He said, SubhanAllah, after a few months, you know, uh, you know, Allah put an answer in my mind and my heart. And that was by concentrating on their main evidence. And their main evidence is, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ that the munafiqun, the hypocrites, they used they used to visit the company of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They used to visit the Prophet sallam, and they used to also ascend to the kalima, to the shahada thing. Mm. So after explaining uh, a grammatical ruling, he says that idha jaak al munafiqun, that the munafiqun used to come to you. Mm. They're ah. coming. Their coming and going is thabit. Mm. Their going is established, but their sitting is not established. SubhanAllah. So from this, you can tell there's two types of people. And he gave an example. He said, look, in your masjid, you have those regular musallis, those mm. who come regularly. And then you have, you know, once in a blue, maybe once in a month, once in a year, they cause a bit of fitna and then they disappear. So he says, these munafiqun would come and they would go. Their iyab and dihab is established, but their julus and their company with the Prophet is not established. So to, to interrupt for a second there to clarify to everyone that if somebody is a regular in a masjid, you never go home and say so-and-so came to the masjid, right? <laughs> if uh, uh, so, uh, Abdullah and Abdurrahman and Abdur Rauf always pray in the masjid, it's never news that they came to the masjid. You would never say it. Okay. Whereas if, if, if uh, Rudwan or somebody or uh, Samih never comes to the masjid, it becomes news that he showed up. Yes. Asan, that's, that's a fetch. Because that is such a subtlety there. 
Yeah, that, that is a beautiful point. Barakallahu feekum. And he said, who are those people with whom the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam would say? Allah instructed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as in Surah Al-Kahf, Wasbir nafsaka ma'al ladhini yad'oona rabbahum bil ghadati wal ashi yuridun wajha. He persisted in staying with those who call their Rabb, their Lord, morning and evening, seeking Allah's pleasure. And then also there's a verse, وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَأَشْيُرِ الْوَجْهَةِ Do not dismiss those Sahaba. So he's now, he's making, he's creating a hypothesis, right? Mm. And, and he's also dismantling their position using the Qur'an. And subhanAllah, he said, in Surah Munafiqun, there's a verse which clearly suggests that even the Munafiqun, they knew that they were not amongst those who used to sit with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Munafiqun would say to one another, to each other, do not spend on those who are with the Prophet, عند رسول الله. Meaning, they knew themselves they are not amongst those who sit with the Prophet. Otherwise, why would they say, don't, sit, uh, don't yep. spend on them? Yes? Uh, okay. Between this discussion, he also mentioned, uh, as a side point, was very powerful. And he, and he asked the audience, he said, look, if somebody is mavloom, if somebody is oppressed, would you like to be part of them? Would you like to be with them? So, for example, now it was happening in Gaza and Palestine, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate Palestine. Amen. And what, in other parts of the Muslim world, you know, we, 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 we feel for them, we feel pain, we want to help them. But people generally don't want to be involved in the oppression because it puts you in a difficult position. He said from the Quranic discourse, it is clear that the concept of nifaq started in Medina. Mm. Because in Medina, when Islam began to grow and gain strength this is when there was benefit for outwardly accepting islam mm. those bedouins and arab that came they said we have accepted islam the quran says don't say you have accepted islam say you have uh, uh, sorry don't say you have accepted iman say you have accepted islam yeah and he not hitherto entered your heart so he said, those who accepted Islam in Mecca, they had to be sincere because generally Muslims mm. in Mecca were going through oppression. So to interrupt again, thesis number two or point number two, evidence number two, is that Nifaq only derived after the Hijrah. The Hijrah. And where did Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhum accept uh, Islam? In Mecca. Mm. Mm. So that question is not even applicable, the nifaq. The notion of nifaq is inapplicable in, in, in their regard. Uh, so, and then he says, well, the munafiqun, they also realized that there are certain sahaba who are with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There are those who sit with the Prophet alayhi wasallam. There are those who sit in his com company constantly. So in order to make a division, uh, create fitna, they made their own masjid, which the Quran speaks of. They built a masjid on the basis of kufr, disbelief, uh, dirar, uh, harm, uh, and, and disbelief and وتفريق بين المؤمنين وتفريق بين المؤمنين to cause division and disunity amongst the believers because these believers are with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as soon as they built this masjid the munafiqin the hypocrites they wanted uh, a validation they mm. wanted um, you know if they uh, so who did they call they called the best person Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as soon as they invited the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to pray Salah in this masjid, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was told by Allah, لا تقم فيه أبدا. Subhanallah. Oh my Prophet, do not even stand in this place. لمسجد أسس على التقوى من أول يوم أحق أن تقوم فيه. 
فيه رجال يحبون أن يتطهروا والله يحب المطهرين. Indeed, the masjid, either Masjid Quba or Masjid Nabi, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whose foundation was based on righteousness and taqwa, is better and more deserving that you pray in there. Why? Because there are men in there who رجال يحبون أن يتطهروا who love purification and والله يحب المطهرين and Allah loves those who um, uh, who acquire tahara and purification. So now down here, you know, purification is, as you know, Sheikh, is of two types. You have the uh, baltini and the zahiri. You have the internal tahara and the external tahara. The internal tahara is of kufr and shirk, etc. Bid'an. And then you have the external tahara where a person uh, does ghusl, uh, mm-hmm. uh, he has a bath and ablution. This verse can refer to both. And in this context, you can, it, it also refers to internal tahara. Because the munafiqeen, the kuffar, in terms of belief, they are uh, impure. They are impure. إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ najis, You know, they are impure. And it's not befitting for the Prophet wasallam to pray salah there. And the point here, which is very important, the Prophet wasallam was not told to uh, do, do ruku or do not do sajda. He was told, don't even place your blessed foot in this place. Mm. So if place your blessed foot in this place, ruku and sajda is not possible. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say this? Because this is the context of tahar and purification. That, oh my prophet, your blessed foot is tahir, is pure. Subhanallah. It's, it's not befitting for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to place his blessed foot in such a place, in such a room, where the munafiqeen are, who are impure. They are impure. So, mm. the question is, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejected that the Prophet sallallahu mm. placed blessed for even for a short while in a room where the munafiqeen are, then how is it possible that he sleeps with two of them in the same room till Qiyamah? So, to recap for everybody, first of all, if you are on Instagram and you want to see both of us, hop over to YouTube's Safina Society channel. The subject today is on an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, refutation or clarification on the differences between believing companions and hypocrites solely from the Quran, so that nobody could say this is your made-up hadith. Okay, that's the book and the source that Shia and Sunni will both go to and agree is their source. So the Sheikh brought three so far points. The first point is the Quran uh, references the the believers only as sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and for the hypocrites, it's established that they come and go. But they never sit. Okay. And the Prophet ﷺ was commanded never to even set foot with them. La taqum fi abada and ida ja'ak al munafiqun. Okay. Point number two that the nifaq, hypocrisy, which is outwardly Islam and inwardly kufr, only occurred after the hijrah. And one brother said, no, this is not true because there are some people. There's once a, a person became Muslim, then he went and became a murtad. I said, it is true because we are talking about hypocrisy. Being an apostate is not hypocrisy. Being a hypocrite is you declare yourself as a Muslim and you say that you aren't, but truly you are not. And as a result, the, the ayah there is, right? the, the Bedouin said, we believe. لا تقولوا آمنا بل قولوا أسلمنا. Right. You haven't believed. Say you have submitted only. So the second point is hypocrisy did not exist in Mecca. It existed only after Mecca. Okay. When the Muslims were having good times. Point number three for those just following is that the munafiq is the opposite of pure. Believers are described by Allah as pure, and munafiqs are described by Allah as the opposite of that. In other words, it's a contrast. Okay, 
Allah says, Do not stand in the mosque of these hypocrites, for Allah loves the pure. Mafhum al mukhalafa here, learning something from the opposite is that the hypocrite is not pure. Okay? Three points so far. Okay, continue. And also, Sheikh, um, just to remind uh, you that even the munafiqun, they themselves knew that they're not amongst those who are with the Prophet. Uh, the the munafiqun in the Quran themselves said, do not spend with those with the Prophet. Mm -hmm. So they identified their rivals or those they don't like, they identified them as people who sit with the Prophet. That's three ayat indicating that Okay. Okay. And and also Sheikh, we from the Quran is very clear. Yeah. That one of the habits of the Munafiqun was to ridicule and mock mm. the believer. Uh, so the Sahaba, this is an instruction to the Sahaba. Mm. In Surah Nisa, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ يُكْفَرُ بِهَا وَيُسْتَهَزَأُ بِهَا That when you hear the verses of Allah being rejected and ridiculed, فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعَهُمْ حَتَّى يَخُوضُوا فِي حَدِيثٍ غَيْرِ Do not sit with them until mm, then. Mm. So Many the, so far. Mm. Yeah, so, so this is instruction to the Sahaba not to sit with them. <clears throat> so, so then, you know, then, uh, you know uh, what do you think will be uh, regarding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And also, there's another verse. I mean, you could say munafiqin are they come under ghulam, uh, they are zalimin. And Allah says uh, to Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Wa imma yunsiyan ka shaytan, fala taqud ba'da dikra ma'al qawmi zalimin, fala taqud ba'da dikra ma'al qawmi zalimin." Surah mm -hmm. Naam, verse sixty-eight. So there, are, there are other verses like this which, uh, which postulate. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, generally speaking, he did not sit with the munafiqin. Yes, the munafiqin maybe came, they visited him. You know, there was a uh, maybe ex exchange of words and conversation, mukalama. But sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, benefiting from his company constantly, this is something that the Quran uh, clearly argues against. This uh, the munafiqin did not do this, uh, and those that with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, especially Abu Bakr Umar. So uh, they cannot be munafiq, and this is in the light of the Quran. So at the end, he would say, "May ek baad sam abhi kuch sunay, maybe kuch kahu, but ek baad sam jani aao, ek baad sam jani aaya hu, jani shine risalat me koi munafiq nahi ho sakta." I'm going to say something. You guys listen. I've come to explain one thing: that those who used to sit with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they cannot be munafiq, and this hypothesis is established from the Quran. And then he also wrote a book, which I have in front of me. It's about 300 sides on this topic. Same topic, uh, same title. The Shia named his book Me'yadi Sahabiyat, but he had a different color, Me'yadi Sahabiyat. So this is approximately mm -hmm. uh, just under 300 sides. And he's mentioned many, 300. What's the signs? Uh, 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 sides, sides, pages. Oh, pages. Okay, okay, okay. I see, yeah. Yeah, and, and he has mentioned uh, many verses uh, and ahadith in here uh, to uh, establish this theory that those who used to sit with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they cannot be munafiq in the light of the Quran. Hmm. And then, now, what is the proof from the Quran that Abu Bakr and Umar and Aisha, for example, sat with the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Uh, from the Quran, yeah, or from an agreed upon source with that the Shia will concur to. I mean, I think I think the Shia believe that the, the Shia do believe that they they were uh, they were the closest companions. I mean, that is I don't think that's an argument of disputation. How about uh, believe that you had mentioned to me that the Shia also recognize that those buried next to the Prophet are Abu Bakr and Omar? Yes, and that is much more than sitting with somebody for half an hour. Exactly. That's e centuries now. Yes. Uh, I do remember I was having a, a dialogue with the Shia and he and I mentioned this, that Abu Bakr 
and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu they are buried with, next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they will be resurrected together from that same yes. soil. Subhanallah. Uh, and, and, and we also believe that the Anbiya alayhi wa salatu wa salam are alive uh, in their graves and this is why we give salam when we uh, visit the Rawza uh, Sharif. Uh, so he mentioned, well, they were, they were uh, buried without the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's permission. Okay. And the verse he gave us, Ya ayu al-lazina amanu la tadkhulu buyuta al-nabiyyi illa an yu'adha lakum in Surah Ahzab. Mm. Ob- mm. Do not enter the houses of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except that permission is granted to you. So I said, well, this is evidence that they had Iman because the address is Ya ayu al-lazina amanu. <laughs> Subhanallah. Subhanallah. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, brought, he brought the proof against himself. Yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, also, how about, of course, Sayyidina Abu Bakr is very well known that yeah. uh, uh, And they, Shia concur it was Abu Bakr mm-hmm. Because uh, if they don't, then they take away that Sayyidina Ali was in the house mm-hmm. in the, During yeah. the Hijrah mm. so, MashaAllah I, I think uh, when it comes to uh, our epistemology, the only the only thing that we can agree on with the Shia is the Quran. Yeah. Although there's a discussion whether they believe in the Tahrif, etc. And the scholars, you know, Nur al-Tabrisi has written a book, Al-Fasl al-Khitab, Fi Ithbar al-Tahrif al-Kitab Rabbi al-Arbab. Notwithstanding all that discussion, I mean, this is the, Quran is the only thing that we can agree, both of us, that, you know, we can discuss. And our teacher would uh, emphasize on this, that when it comes to discussions with the Shias, we should just use the Quran. Yeah. Also, um, Sayyidah Aisha is established by the ayah of entering the home. Ya ayyuh al-ladhina amanu la tadkhulu. Yes. And she obviously clearly entered and lived. Yes. So yes. that's two. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidah Aisha, directly from the Quran. Now mm-hmm. there, we are holding the assumption that they recognize Sayyidina Umar was always with the Prophet, peace be upon him. Mm-hmm. But what if somebody was to reject that assumption and they would say, no, we're only disputing from the Quran. So is it possible? Is it possible? Is there any uh, indicator of Sayyidina Umar keeping the company of the Prophet or entering his home from the Quran directly? Of Sayyidina Umar ta'ala. Yeah, just to make, to make it airtight, even though we recognize that they don't dispute that Sayyidina Umar kept the Prophet's company, but in case they did, and we only want to refute from the Qur'an. I mean, the onus of evidence would be on them, that why, you know, such a thing that's uh, accepted academically even in their, you know, in their books. In their books, why, yeah. yeah. Why is he disputing this? Mm-hmm. In that, the question, that, that's the question that we need to ask. Yeah. Why is he disputing this? Can I ask you something else about uh, Shi'i theology and terminology? Is there a difference between Seb and La'an among in their theology and their aqidah? You know, to be a uh, Sheikh, I don't know. La Adri, uh, I don't know. If you could look into this, because I kept receiving a Shi'i saying, "Nahnu la nasub sahaba la nasubu as-Sahaba." But okay. what happened was that a clip was released. Okay. Saying as seb is for you to curse somebody, okay. But Allah is to believe that Allah has cursed them, oh, and this is where people get very confused when they say, when people say, Lana subbu sahaba, we don't curse the sahaba, but you believe in their la'an, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that's a type of taqiyya where they do the idmar of. Mm-hmm. It's idmar aqidat al wa idhar adam al sab. So they manifest that they don't curse, but they do believe in la'an. And that is a type of taqiyya trick that is done when they need to. Mm-hmm. And I believe that the one who was leaked, it was leaked from, is in England and he's one of their big Shi'is, Shi'i imams, second generation born. What's his name? Uh, the second generation born, what? he comes to NYU all the time, cause trouble. Yeah, 
um, I think he comes to NYU, but he's from London. And he's... Uh, Ahmad Naqshawani. Nak- I believe that's him, yeah. Yeah. Ahmad yeah. Naqshawani, yeah. He's Lebanese uh, Shia, I, I believe, yeah. So, yeah, he's the one who... That that was leaked. It wasn't meant to be on YouTube, but it ended up on YouTube. Yeah. I mean, uh, our teacher would say that the first people who criticized the Sahaba... Uh, uh, with the Mushrikeen of Makkah when they said وَإِذَا قِيدَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ قَالُوا أَنُؤْمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَهَا And then when they were told to bring Iman like the people have brought Iman and the people that brought Iman at that time with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the Sahaba so they responded قَالُوا uh, أَنُؤْمِنُوا Shall we bring Iman كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَهَا like the foolish people نعوذ بالله have brought Iman so Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala responded to them by saying Listen very carefully. Indeed, these people who are cursing the Sahaba, they are the foolish people. Uh-huh. However, they don't know. So the question here is, they call the uh, Sahaba Sufaha, foolish people. Sufaha is plural of Safi. And even in the Arabic language, there are other words for uh, Safi, Ghabi, Ahmad, etc. Mm. Uh, Allah could have chosen any other word. He could have also said, well, for them, this painful punishment, well, these people are misguided. There are many other words that Allah could have chosen. Uh, but Allah decided to choose this, the same word, Allah innahum sufaha. So they use the word sufaha, Allah used the word sufaha. So from this, our teacher said, you can understand the principle that whatever you say regarding the Sahaba, that is what Allah will say regarding you. Subhanallah al Subhanallah, Hajib, yeah. Hajib, Hajib. Uh, can you explain to everybody, in very briefly, the importance of heresiology in the life of a Muslim? Because some people imagine that what's important is what's happening, and that's a type of bias. That in importance is only that which is sort of in the news, <laughs> right? And it's a type of bias that we we grade what's important based upon what's happening right in front of us. Mm-hmm. And so that we should dismiss everything else and then we should just be unified on what's happening at this very moment. So could you tell everybody why is it important for my iman, for my deen, for my akhira to care about aqidah and heresy? Because salvation is based on this. I mean, our salvation in the Akhirah is primarily based on Aqidah and Iman. And if a person ha- doesn't have this and they have everything else from an Islamic theological perspective, this is failure in the Akhirah. And the Quran clearly mentions this. Those people whose endeavors uh, were wasted in this dunya uh, yet they assume that they're doing good. So uh, salvation, so that I think the, 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 que- the ultimate question should be, what is the ni plus ultra uh, and criterion for, of salvation? Is iman, number one, is correct aqidah, and then a'mal. Yes. So whilst it is important that we uh, you know, live in the present moment and we address issues that are surrounding us, uh, we, you know, we shouldn't forget our ultimate purpose in this life, uh, which is to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, which is to recognize Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. This is why they say, if, if, if a person, uh, knowledge, what is knowledge? You know, one of the scholars he, he asked in the uh, uh, students, uh, how do you define an alim? How do you define a scholar? Uh, so different students give uh, different answers, and. Uh, one said, well, you study seven years, eight years, nine years. One said, you study sarf nahwa, you know, mantik, fasaha, balara, etc. He said, if this is the mi'yar and the criteria of being an alim, this formal criteria, then no one amongst the sahaba is an alim. Hmm. Yet they're all ulama. Subhanallah. The entire discourse was based on this verse, innama yakhsha allaha min ibad ulama. Subhanallah. So, from the servants of Allah, those who carry knowledge, they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the ultimate objective, is to recognize Allah. And khashya here, like Imam Raghub al-Asfahani mentions, khashya here, fear here is not the fear that you and I have from a, you know, a lion, for example, or, or a snake. 
uh, in the UK here, many people, even spiders. Khashya uh, here is from a point of reverence and mm. adama that you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because you're recognizing ma'rifah, that who he is, he's your creator, everything. So just to, I don't, I don't want to give a monologue, Sheikh, but I think uh, we need to understand that what is our uh, ultimate purpose of existence? Why, why are we here in this dunya? You know, mm-hmm. do you think you've been created without any purpose? What, and do you think uh, you, uh, you, you will return to me? So having knowledge of the Akhirah and preparing for the Akhirah is, is actual knowledge. This is mm-hmm. real knowledge. Knowledge of the dunya is being, I mean, what's the verse that comes to mind in Surah Rum, I think is, yes, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to those people who don't have iman. And he says, uh, mm-hmm. Majority of people, they don't have ilm. Mm-hmm. And he does it's bad of ilm. They only have knowledge of the apparent of the dunya. What's going on in the dunya? This is the knowledge uh, they have. Subhanallah. But this, but this is tantamount to jahl. That's yeah. why Allah rejected it. Subhanallah. They don't Subhanallah. have knowledge. Yeah. And the knowledge they do have is just what's happening, the apparent of the dunya. Subhanallah. You know, regarding the akhirah, they're ghafil. You know, neglectful, uh, they're unaware. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answered your question. About it, it definitely did. And the uh, uh, no matter how much knowledge you have of the finite, if you're ignorant of the infinite, it's a small amount. It's essentially nothing, because uh, the, if we drew, if we were to draw a line for a million years of knowledge, and then we begin drawing the infinite line, for a period of time, the finite seems bigger than the infinite. And then at some point, they're almost equal. And then at some point, the infinite is a little greater than the equal. But then eventually, there is going to come a day where the million years of knowledge is nothing but a small speck Mm. in comparison to the infinite line. And as a result of that, we can easily say it's zero. It's nothing. There will come a day in the akhirah where you live forever, day after day after day after day after day, Eternally, okay, by Allah's sustenance, that anything that happened here was literally nothing in comparison to it. I want to say something else, too, that this is usually a, a, a retort that people make when they don't like something. Because no matter how much everyone is engrossed in Philistine, I think we all have been for over two months now. Every single day, I know I have personally been. But I still can say that I sat and ate pomegranates with my parents. I sat and I sat with my, went out with my family. I went out with my kids and I did other things too in life, right? Life is actually still moving pretty normally from the day-to-day basis. Your mind may not be 100% uh, happy about things, but you're still picking people up, dropping to basketball games, going to this and that and the other. So then why is somebody saying, oh, hold on a second, Philistine's happening and you're talking about this? Hold on. Everybody, you critic included, are living eg- everyday regular life. Like no, nothing changed in the daily routine. So then why is it that you're coming when, some, when something you don't like, you say, oh, you're talking about this when Philistine is happening. So it's uh, a non-sequitur, something that's, to be, uh, that's completely rejected. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, aminu. Okay? Aminu. O you who believe, believe. One of the meanings of this ayah is, O you who have a general belief of Islam, become knowledgeable about this belief. What is actually la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah mean? You know that when I was young, 14, 13, 12 years old, I hadn't been taught except the basics when i used to see shabab saying they're going to syria to study they're going to university of medina was giving out free scholarships to study i never understood what is it there to study aqidah more than that allah's one right you're jahil you're young you don't know anything and that the study of the sharia is essentially just a long list of things not to do this is the idea and the mentality of many many people into adult life so they're believers, they believe in Allah and His Messenger, but they need to actually do more 
Amen. Uh, study of what their Amen is. Okay. Uh, so that is the point of uh, studying these arguments and these differences because Allah commands us to study our religion. Okay. Whether anyone likes it or not, that's what we study. Studying religion has no, is not confined to current affairs. And it's not confined to anything else like this. Now, can I ask you, um, are there, was there a retort to this response by Sheikh uh, uh, Khaled? Was it Khaled Mahmoud? Yeah. So, no, there, there, there hasn't been. Uh, he, he passed away just two years ago, approximately a couple of years ago. And he would say, um, quite often I heard him more than once saying this, that if you disagree with my hypothesis, if you disagree with the evidences that I've used, please tell me, let me know. Mm. Very open about this because yep. uh, uh, he basically confined, uh, uh, sorry, he he he, um, he defined the concept of uh, being a Sahabi from the Quran. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just want to add to Sheikh what you've already said is, uh, I think I know where the that concern or that that point is coming from where you're saying that we should study our Aqid and Iman and the issue of Palestine is happening, therefore we shouldn't be talking about these topics. Uh, and mashallah, you have explained it well. Uh, but the thing I want to add on is we're discussing this academically. We are not calling towards, you know, some sort of violence or hate. We just mm -hmm. discuss a topic which is a, you know, Quranic discourse. Uh, all the evidence that we've just uh, mentioned now mm -hmm. is, is from the Quran. Uh, and uh, I think we should have more discussions like this, uh, especially uh, discussions that are true with our Iman and, and the Sahaba. Because the Sahaba, uh, what we need to understand is that the, the Mi'yar of their Iman or the criteria of their Iman is the Iman that we need to follow. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stipulated guidance mm -hmm. by following the Iman of the Sahaba. Yes. Subhanallah. This is very clear. So if Subhan they bring Iman, like you have brought Iman, addressing the Sahaba, then they will then they will gain guidance. So we need to understand that defending the Iman of the Sahaba, speaking about the Iman of the Sahaba is part of the Quran, is part of our Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And this is why Imam Tahawi Rahmatullah uses very you know, harsh, not harsh words, but la uh, uh, munasib words that, you know, uh, uh, cursing the Sahaba or mm. having Sahaba. Uh, this is, you know, it's nifaq and kufr and tughiyan. He uses words like this, you know, paraphrasing. And, and from an uh, epistemic point of view, we need to understand, and I want to mention this point, uh, if, 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 if I may, please, is one of the reasons that we give uh, for the haqqaniyat, for the truth and the veracity of Islam, which is a fasl, you could say one of the fasl, you know, differentials between Islam and the rest of the religion is we have something called isnad, chain of transmission. As yes. Abdullah said, if there was no chain of transmission, then anybody would say whatever they, you know, they wanted to say. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have this epistemic, uh, rigorous system yes. where Every word we say regarding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or we give a, a, a religious injunction or jurisprudential ruling from a hadith, we can trace this back to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from our teachers and then from their teachers. And not only are the narrators of these chains, uh, their names are preserved, their biographies are also preserved. Yes. yes. Uh, etc. So our, Alhamdulillah, this is one of the things. And this Isnad system, this rigorous epistemic system does not exist in any other religion. Correct. This is exclusive to Islam, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. What we need to understand that the first link, the first link between our religion, our Quran and our Sunnah and the Prophet وسلم, is the Sahaba. Mm. That is the first link in the chain. Yes. If that link cuts off, the whole chain falls. Everything there. falls. And let me mention this from the Quran, if you allow me, please. وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُ الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ 
ولا يجدون في صدورهم حاجة مما أوتوا ويؤثرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم خصاصة ومن يوق شح نفسي فأولئك مفلحون في سورة حشر Allah is referring to the Ansar, yeah? the Sahaba that were living in Medina, in their prayers. They are those people who have made Medina, Dar is referring to Medina, as their home, and Iman as their home. So the word Tabawwa, 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 or Tabawwa, it means Istiqrar, yani they made, they adopted Medina as their home, and Iman as their home. The question is, you can understand USA, uh, you know, uh, New Jersey, New York, etc. being your home, you know, Bradford, Birmingham, Manchester being your home. But Allah is connected. Atf. Iman is also their home. Iman is a modality. It's not something that's tangible. It's a kayfi of the heart. Mm. So the Sahaba have made uh, Medina their home and they've made Iman their home. Mm. So Iman mentioned this. And just recently, I was um, uh, reading uh, at Tasil Ulum in Tanzil by Ibn Juzayr, mm. I believe he's also Maliki, yes? He was he's from, from Un- uh, yeah, Granada. Say yeah. again? He was from uh, Granada, Granada. Yes, yeah. Yeah, Andes. I love him. He also mm-hmm. was Shaheed too, Rahimahullah. So uh, he says the reason Allah's mentioned Iman <clears throat> with Medina, Dar Medina, is they were so sincere. And they were so mukhlis in their iman as though they were the residents of iman as they were residents of Medina. SubhanAllah. So the residents are uh, Sahaba. Mm-hmm. Uh, residents, the makan is iman. SubhanAllah. So makin are the Sahaba, those who are living are the Sahaba, and where they are living, the locus or the location is iman. Now, do you see a house without the residents? If you see a house, nobody's living in there. What happens to this house? Kharab. Kharab. In the same way, without the Sahaba, a single verse of the Quran would, not, would have not reached us. And uh, where does the fish live? Where does the fish reside? In water. In the, mm. in the sea, water. Anybody who wants to go into the water, they have to imitate to some degree the fish. They have to mm. move their hand feet and if they don't they will drown subhanallah in the same way whoever enters iman they have to imitate the iman of the sahaba otherwise they will drown subhanallah subhanallah and, and we should use these definitive verses uh, you know these historical spurious ambiguous unverified uh, events and each verse of the quran repudiates completely refutes this those who accepted Iman before the conquest of Mecca and after. Allah has promised Jannah for all of them. وَأَلْزَمَهُمْ Subhanallah. And this is regarding all the Sahaba in general. وَأَلْزَمَهُمْ Allah has made it lazim for them. As you know, Shaykh, whom is for umum, is definitive. وَأَلْزَمَهُمْ Allah has made it lazim for them. Lazim. Why is he made lazim? كَلِمَةَ taqwa The word of piety. The word of righteousness. What does lazim mean? Compulsory, imperative, paramount. What does lazim mean? Lazim means, for example, the light for the sun is lazim. Mm. The, uh, the wetness for the water is lazim. The sweetness for the honey is lazim. You can't imagine the sun without its light. You can't imagine water without its wetness. In the same way, you can't imagine a single sahabi without iman and taqwa. So the question the question arises did Allah force this on them no no they they were deserving of this mm. so this is not a polemical uh, discourse that we're having here or some sort of you know monavara uh, this is actually a Quranic discourse it's part mm-hmm. of our Eve and our deen like I said epistemically speaking the first chain uh, uh, is, is, is the Sahaba I'd like to say something else about that ayah because you said yuhibbuna man hajara ilayhim so the muhajireen are worthy in the sight of Allah of being loved therefore Allah. they're all mu'mineen subhanallah no muhajir was a munafiq subhanallah Allahu Akbar yep <laughs> and that's <laughs> the direct proof of Sayyidina Umar Right, that we said, what is the direct proof? Because we know that he made the hijrah. 
They themselves call him uh, Mecca. They know he's Mecca. Subhanallah. 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 Allah <laughs> Akbar. Uh, I want to point something that you said, which is that this is an academic discussion about our religion and mm-hmm. not an attack on a group of people. You also mentioned that in the formation of Pakistan, Sunnis and Shias work together for a common good. In the negation of Qadianis, as they brought their fitna, the Sunnis and the Shias also work together. This is the beauty of our Sharia and our tra- tradition is long enough that handles so many situations that every single mawqif has its own rules. Can you explain to it then what are the rules, what are the parameters, you can say, preconditions, limits, what have you, on this kind of uh, uh, unification towards a certain end? I mean, I think that would be, you know, based on the uh, masalih and mafasi principle, the mm. harms and the benefits. If working with another denomination is more beneficial for the general Muslims, yeah, I think that is that that is the correct way, and and especially here in the West, uh, uh, when it comes to um, uh, Muslims, I don't think there is much uh, discrimination between, you know. Uh, it's Shia and Sunni, for example, in many of the issues, like for example, LGBTQ, for example, yeah. or, or issues. So I think in issues like this, uh, there should be a form uh, of unity mm-hmm. and um, uh, and and this doesn't mean, Sheikh. I will also want to clarify: is uh, some people they have got this misconstrued understanding of unity, which means or well, you comp- compromise your beliefs. No, yeah. no, you know it's. It's like almost if you work with somebody, this is tantamount to compromising beliefs. No, uh, they reconcile. Uh, you know, you can reconcile between the notion of working with a denomination that you strongly disagree with for the common benefit of Muslims and Islam, mm-hmm. and at the same time uh, adhere to what you believe without any compromise. I don't see any, you know, like mutual exclusivity. Yeah, between these two notions. There is. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And there's a there's a young guy named Hassan Shami. He's Lebanese. He's one of the best activists that we have online. Um, Hassan Shami, you you've seen his stuff. When it comes to LGBT, when it comes to Israel, he's one of the strongest voices. Mm-hmm. And I still have the intention. I don't know if he's going to see this, but I still have the intention of having him on because uh, he's not. Um, he, firstly, he's not even like a sheikh that's going preaching these things that we don't believe in. He's a regular guy, happens to be a Shia, Lebanese Shia. But his activism is great. Like he's extremely strong, powerful what he does. And I actually respect him for that. So I, I do want to have him on. But it's so important that we don't have, we undo this jahala, okay, that just because somebody does something with somebody one time for a reason, that he's now compromised his dean. Okay. Now, I don't know if we, I, I'd like to bring up some Twitter, some tweets that you put out that is trying to bring together some of the, gr- the groups within Ahl Sunnah <laughs> who are like 95% in agreement on everything. But sometimes those few matters get in the way and yeah. uh, break them apart. So it seems that you do, while we're having this discussion on heresiology, but you also have a great desire to bring uh, Muslims together. Would you like to speak about that for a second? Yeah, so I think, uh, like I said, uh, uh, especially here in the West, I mean, so let me just give you a bit of a, a bit of context here. Yeah. Uh, by the grace of Allah, uh, I've done. Uh, I've been an imam for the last 13, 14 years. Alhamdulillah. So I was in Bradford for almost uh, seven years, six, seven years. Mm. Alhamdulillah, down there we have majority Muslims. Mm-hmm. Uh, majority Muslims, even in the schools, uh, you know, in the high school, etc. We have majority Muslims. And as you know, Al Insan Ibn Al Bi'ah. Yes. A human is the product of the environment. What's the city again? You said Leeds, Bradford. 
Bradford, Bradford, okay. Bradford, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sheikh, I'm offended you haven't heard of it, subhanAllah. Oh, no, I went. I did go. Okay, yeah, okay. I did go, yeah. Sharif, they say. <laughs> Bradford is a very nice... Uh, Birmingham was industrial. Bradford had this beautiful, huge park, and it was a prettier city, I think, than, than Birmingham was, yeah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. So, uh, yeah. so now, Ellsbury, where I've been, uh, this is more in south, towards south, a bit close to London. Mm -hmm. Uh down here, the demographics uh, are quite different. Uh, so, of course, I'm going through a journey where I'm learning and you know, mm -hmm. I'm trying to develop myself. So, I'm, you know, comparing and contrasting, you know, seven years there, six, seven years there, six, seven years here. And I believe the majority of UK, at least, apart from places in Bradford and Birmingham and Leicester and Preston and these places, uh, non-Muslims and then of course in the West majority non-Muslims mm -hmm. here our challenges uh, uh, you know we've got very big challenges like LGBTQ for example you know, atheism and all these other isms and schisms that are on the rise and the attack on Islam and Muslims is not on a specific group it's all of us so this has made me think you know we need to do something about this we need to actually yes this doesn't mean we compromise our differences and we say, you know, uh, we unite in theology, which is impossible. I think that's, that's impossible. Uh, it's not rationally impossible. It's mustahil adatan, at least, you know, it's never happened. Yep. And, 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 I, and I don't think it'll ever happen, yes? Yep. It's never happened. Always been there and it was always stay there. So it's normatively impossible to even call to notion of uh, theological unification. I think that's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so my thing is now that I think even polemics, and to be honest, you know, I need to confess I'm also a polemicist. May Allah forgive me. I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. good. But even polemics, our polemics should be discussed in certain context, in a certain way. You know, we have adab al bahth and you know, classroom settings, maybe academic settings, maybe you know, in writing, for example. Because what I'm seeing is a lot of the online polemics especially is creating further disunity within the uh, Muslim denominations mm -hmm. and that is becoming a barrier for us to work together in order to defend Islam which is a big problem mm -hmm. for example I'm not going to mention any names yes any places but just generally speaking I've seen masjids where they will happily take pictures with priests and Christian, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. Uh, you know, you're working with Ahlul Kitab, for example. You can have your opinion about that and whatever. But then they will be terrified, petrified, to sit with another Muslim from another denomination. Subhanallah. And I've been told, they go, uh, Sheikh, please, let's not take a picture. Subhanallah. Said, no, 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 nobody, I will take a picture. Yeah, nobody. And go, and they say, no, 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 put the phone away. Please, nobody take a picture. Subhanallah. I realize, whoa, this is this is this is really bad. So yeah. you know, we do have this, unfortunately, uh, in some areas, and um, I think we need to uh, we need to we need to do something about it. There is another sheikh that we had on, who's on the okay. same wavelength as you. Okay. Ya Omar, the 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 murid of Sheikh Samir al Nas, Sheikh Nur al Din. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's he, yeah. I'm in contact with him, mashallah. He's, he, he doesn't too far from here, mashallah. He's yeah. also with the same, same mindset, mashallah. It's something where you could say, okay, we can recognize ikhtilafat or here, but it's actually um, a mafsada if we don't recognize to not recognize that there are ada, there are enemies who don't care what your menhaj is. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And regarding that group. There should, there has to be a unification of 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 a response to them. Yes, right? when it comes yes. to that, uh, uh, that's extremely important. But sure, I would say is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I had a friend and student uh, saying to me recently. Uh, he says to me, "Malana, I think you know now it makes sense why being sectarian is more easy." <laughs> yeah, Subhanallah. <laughs> because Subhanallah. you your little crowd they're with you. Yeah. Uh, and, and you'll have these people in every denomination, every group, you know, who who, who don't want this. It's like, you know, you're off yeah. the manhaj or you're off the maslak, you, you know, you know. And, and subhanAllah, I heard a scholar saying that the moderate-minded people from two different groups mm -hmm. 
will get on with each other more than the extreme and the moderate of the same group. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Uh, two intelligent people from, I would even say, different religions altogether. Intelligent, but also emotionally healthy. Like mm -hmm. they were raised well and they didn't have any dramas in their upbringing. Can probably, they only have 5% in common. Mm -hmm. But they're wise enough and mature enough to, to, to deal with each other in a beneficial way. Mm -hmm. In contrast to emotionally un uh, unstable people who have 95% in agreement and only 5% yeah. disagreement, will find a way to create a civil war over the 5%. <laughs> and, and the proof of that is that he, you have neighbors all the time. I think most of, uh, probably in your youth, most of your neighbors weren't Muslims. Mm -hmm. In my youth, right now, from my youth until now, I never had a little mo Muslim cul-de-sac, right? Or mm -hmm. a Muslim a block, or a street or something but you learn to survive, right? You yeah. set in your mind parameters. He and his mind have parameters. We both know the parameters unspokenly and we're very happy as neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. So why can't that apply then mm -hmm. uh, to a, a mukhalif, mm -hmm. right? And by the way, many people who talk, and because I talk about heresiology a lot, I care about aqidah I, because I care about the consistency, rational consistency in your beliefs and learning what your beliefs are. We got, we have some of these people of these heretical groups that are on our cul-de-sac, right? And it puts to the test now, okay, what is the adab? You have the adab of the neighbor, right? Although he's that, he's also a neighbor. So he has the hukuk of a neighbor. Mm -hmm. There are the limits of the musahaba of the keeping company of the heretical groups, but you also have the hukuk, the rights of a neighbor. Mm. Okay. So when somebody, a child says, Oh, those are the people that you said they're all fake Muslims. I didn't say fake Muslims, but that's how kids interpret it. Right. That these guys are just fake. <laughs> right. I said, okay, there is a Aqidah point. Boom, boom, boom. But there's also the adab, the manners of how to treat a neighbor. Right. Yeah. And that's what we have to do here. And that's what I said I love about that the Sharia has an adab for every single situation. It gives you an answer for every situation. And it's, it's a way of living that doesn't require you to be some emotional extremist. Like it's mm -hmm. practical. It's something that you could live with. If not, you wouldn't have a billion people in an ummah. In an ummah. If an ummah was impractical. Subhanallah. And, and you had to be some mean person or go to some extremes this ummah couldn't house 1 billion people is the common person would say, Oh, this is crazy. It's too much. It's Sheikh, can I ask you a question? Shoot. I've heard it's psychological reasons, but maybe you can shed light on this. Why mm -hmm. is it we feel more of a threat from someone who is a Muslim? Yeah. And like you said, 95% agreement and 5% disagreement yeah we, we feel more of a threat from this person we feel the need to refute, refute this person than opposed to a person for example who's not even a muslim yeah i think that the reason is that people have a ghayra over their religion mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. they love their faith they love their deen okay they love their religion mm -hmm. and that's the first reason Okay. They believe and feel something I love is being corrupted. Whereas the non-believer himself, he's not corrupting it. He's just not even accepting it. So he's no, so but, far off, right? But he, he's corrupted, for example, Tawheed. So, so there, there's Musharaka in there. For example, Christian. They're also... Okay. I think that's the a type of weakness from our standpoint. Because we're... Many times people adopt Islam more than Allah Himself. Right? The adoption is like Islam. More so than is caring about Allah Himself. So it's almost, I think that's a, it's a person hasn't gotten developed enough. Because if you did, then you would say, hold on a second. Hey guys, Christian neighbors, atheist neighbors, that you're, our, that's our creator there that you're talking about. Right? Whereas they, they, there's more of an affinity to Islam. Than, than Allah, than Allah, right, and that's one reason. The second reason is that 
orthodoxy it seems to be threatened mm. from within and it's confusing to the next generation so when you're transmitting your religion it's very easy to say we're muslims they're christians we're muslims they're hindus that's easy for any uh, kid to understand okay we were, we're right we're on the right belief they're on the wrong belief but then when you see a, a sect, it's harder to explain to a kid that not every Muslim is doing it right. It's, mm. it's confusing to a kid. And I think mm. people are very nervous about that confusion. So mm. either they have to go to an extreme or they go to the opposite extreme, which is, no, we're all, it's like a Unitarian type of or uh, inter, intra-perennialist type of uh, religion where oh hold on, we're all Muslims and we don't hate anybody, we don't dislike anybody because they don't want the tension of having to make tafsir and say, mm. this is what we believe, this is what we don't believe, this is how we interact. And Allah knows best. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good much insight. Yeah. You said mention the ghayra. Yeah. And you mentioned, do you think it's also an issue of identity? Mm -hmm. Like, this group, for example, Group A believes they're the Mu'abbir, the true interpreters of Ahlul Sunnah, for example. Mm. So now Definitely. this is their... So when there's somebody else saying, no, no, they're also Ahlul Sunnah, that's it. Like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know what comes to mind is, I'm not sure if you've read uh, what Sheikh Hamza Bakri has mentioned in one of the books. Uh, he's mentioned uh, the five marahil of development between Ashair and Madhuridiya. Mm. No, I didn't read this book. Yeah, he's, category, he's in the Muqaddimah. Mm. Uh, mentions the first marhala was marhala to taqween where the uh, schools were initially developed by Abu Hassan Ashi Ali and Abu Masur Maturidi mm. and marhala he calls it marhala tabayun or tagayun where <clears throat> there was a sort of rejection when they first met when the ideas first met this is you talking about like from uh, I would say um, between 400 500 hijri uh, 400 between 400 and 550 hijri mm. uh, and the rejection was only from the Maturidi side. Yani, so, for example, uh, Imam Nasafi in his uh, Tabsrut Adilla uh, and uh, other Maturidi scholars, they were using harsh words against the Ashaira. But there was no harsh words from the Ashaira. Not that the Ashaira were not aware of the Hanafi Maturidi because you had, for who you had, uh, in that time, you had uh, uh, Imam al Juwaini, uh, Rahmatullah, mm. who wrote his Mughithul Khalq. Yeah? Uh, and you had Imam Ghazali, for example, and you know, so they were they, they were aware of the Hanafiya school, and the Hanafiya school was the Maturidi school, uh, but it was from one side, and and, and, the, and the harsh words were from uh, the Maturidi sides. Mm. But then in the age, there was like a tafahum, mm. and that the, the person who played a big role in this was Ar Razi, Imam Razi, when he travelled to Mawara and Nahar Trans uh, Trans and you know, he met with the Maturidi uh, scholars, Sabuni, etc. The point here is, uh, Sheikh Hamza Bakri actually mentioned this. He said the reason there were these harsh words from the scholars of Mawara and Nahar is because they thought they're the mu'abbir of the Aqidah of the Ahlul Sunnah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. You see this Ashari theology coming into from Iraq and think, oh. Yep. Subhanallah. Okay. Yeah. I think and just psychologically, you know, just naturally when you first hear of different views, you can think, you know, you, be, you, you resist. Yeah. <laughs> Allah. And that's the pers the the perspective of the someone who's the imam, someone who's the leader, and there is a social order that he believes he's protecting too. So on, we could look at it negatively and say that's his nafs and it's hubb riyasa, and it could be that, right? And it also could be that this imam, this leader, is actually the leader not just of the aqidah but also of a social order. Like this community views me as the leader, right? Now there's another alpha coming in, claiming proofs and knowledge. Everyone's going to be diverted to them now. And then the structure that we built up for every, for, and we're all happy with is going to collapse. A lot of times it's that too. People like the social order that they're in. The tabir of the social order is that this is the chief of the aqidah and the protector of the religion. And as a result, that can never be questioned, right? So that's also a amil, right? It's also a factor. And unfortunately, all these factors are like inside, so we can't really tell what is what, right? But the cure, one of the cures for this is 
like the Habayb always say that you will not qualify in the sight of Allah as a wali until you are satisfied with your soul to be used to wipe the garbage. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Uh, uh, no, like imagine like there's a, a gar- big garbage container. Nobody washes the garbage container, right? Those huge garbage containers that are outside like buildings and stuff. Nobody ever washes them. They're closed. The truck comes, empties them out. No one would ever go around with their body and wash it. But the Badawi, they say, you're not humble until you are satisfied and accept that for the sake of this ummah, not your hand, your soul will be your ruh, will be used to scrub the inside of the garbage container of the ummah. So imagine that level of humility and tark riyasa that takes a lot of spiritual work. A lot of spiritual work. And I remember Abdul Karim Yahya transmitting that one of the Habayib said that when you go out for da'wah, love personal ibadah more than you love da'wah. Because the day comes for whatever reason that you have to leave the microphone. And you said you shouldn't desire this, but if it comes, right? May Allah keep us all established in da'wah. Fi sabilillah. But if it comes that day, you should take your family out to dinner and you should be very happy because now Allah. you're mutafarrikh. You're Allah. free for ibadah now, right? But you can't be free to something that you don't know. You can't be happy to now be doing something that you've never done before so that a person should have a lot of private worship. Imam Malik was approached by, I believe it was, who was it? Ah, Wahb. Wahb. Ibn Wahb. Ibn Wahb. Ibn Wahb came and met Malik. He said, I arrived in the masjid before Fajr. And I saw Malik sitting before Fajr, having prayed to Hajjud, and is sitting now waiting for the Adhan of Fajr to go. And we had a chance to speak. And I said, Ma hadihi nadara. Like, what is this, like, luminescence of your face? And Malik said, ha- Take for yourself a private ibadah between you and Allah privately. There's nobody but you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah, Allah. ta'ala will cast a light inside your heart. Allahu Akbar. And that's the spirituality that's going to undermine the humility needed for people to, to do da'wah. Also, the attacks. Because you've been attacked, right? And you were disinvited. And I don't understand how you were disinvited over the beard when you have a beard that's mashallah. Right? Um, uh, <laughs> How they attacked you over the beard. Maybe you just, just made one comment that the beard may not be any a necessity in all the madhabs or some, some very minor thing, and he got disinvited over that. Sheikh, I said it's mukhtar. I didn't even mention the Hanifi school. This is the thing. SubhanAllah. I would have got, got slaughtered if I said Hanifi Oh, school. man. <laughs> I said the Shafi school. Why? Because I've got Shafi teachers, and they've told me themselves. Yeah. Well, it was, it's, yeah, just just to look, I've got mashallah. It is a mashallah, and it's um, subhanallah. The Hanafis here, who like have corporate jobs, they all cite a book from Jordan, right? Which I'm sure you know very well, right? And the, and the Hanafi scholars know very well, and they refute yeah. it very well. But but for a regular everyday Muslim, right? He's got a corporate job, and he needs to have a regular beard. They cite this Hanafi book from Jordan, right? A Jordanian scholar and all the Arabs. Is there any Arab that has a fist length anymore? Can you name an Arab with a fist length? Yeah, so some of our teachers, they Today. do have been, uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Muwafaq al murabi of Damascus was in mm-hmm. his, his son, Sheikh Salim Murabi. Today? So, Alive today? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They've got a madrasa, they've got a mahad now. Uh, yeah. Mahad al in, uh, in in Istanbul. Mm. So, now the thing is, look, I mean, if a person has a fist uh, and that's their position, Alhamdulillah, uh, the problem that I have is where the entire deen is judged based uh, you know, on the length of the beard. And subhanAllah is... I mean, look, even within Hanafi school, you had Sheikh uh, Imam Zaid al-Gawthiri, rahimahullah ta'ala. Yeah. Okay? I mean, just, just to sound a bit polemical... And he had I, a trimmed beard. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And I sound a bit polemical. Uh, if, if, uh, sure, <laughs> sure. That's what makes yeah. us. Uh, I mean, the look, pro- half, yeah. 
Hafiz ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi, uh, most of the refutations that people used, uh, uh, especially they within the Hanafi school, are from Imam Zain al You know, he 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 is the guy. I mean, look at his beard. Look at the beard of Sheikh al-Islam, uh, the last Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire. It was Hanafi, Sheikh Mustafa Sabri. Subhanallah. Uh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Futta Abu Ghudda, most of his life, yes, near the end. And, I mean, look at his beard. Yeah. Are, are, we, are we seriously suggesting now, you know, yeah. Yeah. this was my and honestly, oof. Subhanallah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, Allah. <laughs> it's unreal. It is, it's unreal that this, so disinvited, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> Shay Ajib, yani. Shay Ajib. And, and what program got cancelled? Palestinian program got cancelled. Shay Ajib. <laughs> And I was like, what? Unbelievable. But the Ajib thing is, Sheikh, you know, that program got cancelled, but Allah opened uh, doors for another seven, eight programs. Yeah. But but so, the Ajib thing, some of the people that, you know, tried to cancel me, their teacher called me. <laughs> oh my gosh. SubhanAllah. <laughs> and what do you say? No, nothing. We didn't even discuss it because, you know, because the issue is about Palestine, you know, everybody yeah. Yes, so Alhamdulillah, I mean, yeah, these things happen. And Sheikh, you know, you, you mentioned something, subhanAllah, you know, about humility. And honestly, you know, it made me introspect uh, about myself. You know, Imam Ghazali speaks about this uh, in his Ihya, about the hub of Irshad. Yeah. You know, the look of addressing people. Yep. You know, people are listening to you and, you know, you, the, yep. there's, there is, a, you know, there's a, something something to this. Yep. And, and in his Al-Muqid Min Al-Dalal, in his autobiography, which is published now also in English, uh, Deliverance from Error, mm. you know, two two of his crises. Uh, one is the intellectual, you could say. And just by the way, just to clarify, some Orientalists and even some, unfortunately, some Muslim academics are influenced by this. Mm. People like Frank, they say, Na'udhu Billah, Imam Ghazali had shak in Iman, in nafs al-Iman. This is, this is, this is wrong, it's khata. Yeah. What Imam Ghazali says was, it was more to do with an epistemic question of, you know, how do you explain yaqeen? Yes, yeah. Uh, it wasn't, he had doubt in Iman, because having doubt in Iman is, is kufr, yeah. uh, And he mentions that very clearly, but I don't know why this uh, this notion that he had doubt in Iman has become so famous in some circles in academia. So that was one of the things. And then the other thing is the spiritual one. And, 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 and what we need to understand that Imam Ghazali at that time, he had probably the highest post that you can get. Yep. He was the chief professor in the Madras in the uh, which was like the Harvard and the Oxford at the time. Mm-hmm. And he mentioned even the students, per- and those students were not just normal students, you know, students like me, they were scholars, they were ulama. Uh, you had the great Al-Imam uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn al-Arabi al-Maliki. Uh, yeah, he was also, uh, he also took benefit from Imam Ghazali. And so he had an entourage, he was, you know, title was given Hujjatul Islam. And he mentions in there, he says, I knew that, you know, I love this dunya, I, I like this entourage, I love this fame. And mm. if I die, I'm going straight to Jahannam. SubhanAllah. And he was in this, you know, this dilemma for almost like two months. He didn't yep. know what to do. In the morning, I would convince myself, no, I'm doing the work of deen. Yep. You know, I'm mm. teaching people. But then he would question, are you doing it for Allah? Or mm. is it for, like in today's context, is it for the views? Is it for the words, you know? And he had this, and I think he developed an illness, if I remember correctly, is uh, uh, melancholy, I think, a, t- yeah, a form of yeah. depression. And he eventually stopped speaking. And then there was a rumor in, in Baghdad and Iraq that, you know, somebody's doing magic on him. SubhanAllah. Because he said even the scholars couldn't understand that this is the highest position you can get in deen and dunya at that time. And how can you be depressed in such a high position? Not knowing that this is the position. It was because of this position I was feeling uh, like this. And uh, subhanAllah, uh, long story short, he sacrificed this. And one of the things you mentioned about, you know, cleaning, you know, he was a, he was a janitor in, in Damascus for Ajay. almost two years. So the, prof- uh, the professor, the khatib in uh, the masjid of Damascus would say, Hujjatul Islam Abu Hamil al-Ghazali says this, and he was like, you know, clean the toilets. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. You know, subhanAllah. So, I mean, that's one of the, the best examples because I remember COVID being sort of like that. Because if you were somebody who was always used to be around people, uh, it, it's a it's a pickup in one sense, in the sense that you can never be down because you're always gonna be surrounded by people. You're always too busy. You're too busy to ever really be down about anything. You're also a, kind of always too busy for too much introspection. 
right? And so COVID to me was a great test. It was a great test of ikhlas. So if you're working so hard, so-called fi all right, now the masajid are shut down. Now you should be doing ibadah for the sake of Allah. So the same amount of time and the same effort should be put there. So I felt that that was an amazing test and a great thing that happened. I have to honestly say I even miss, uh, even though during COVID I didn't like it, but now I miss it because now it's back to constant work, 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 up early, sleep late. And it's constantly nonstop, nonstop, haraka, haraka, haraka. But uh, you um, you miss those times where you had there's nobody, there's nothing, no one's tugging at you, okay. And you had farag, well, farag means like free time. Um, let's take two, three questions from online. Is that okay before we wrap up? Okay, Sheikh. I mean, I'm I'm always a bit reluctant to take questions, but inshallah, let's see if we can answer them. <laughs> sure, Bismillah. <laughs> All right, brothers and sisters, uh, let's uh, see what you have here. Ask a question related to this, and ra rather than something that's one of those um, polemical, dramatic ones. I know those are the things that are the tabloid questions, I, I call them. It's tabloid stuff, right? There's a lot of stuff that has actually nothing to do with what we talked about, but it's a Sunni and Shia uh, ping pong match happening here back and forth back and forth okay okay um, okay let's see okay so it seems everyone in the chat has uh, gone into the debate. They're debating each other. Okay. They're debating. I don't know if they're even listening to the stream anymore, right? <laughs> um, subhanAllah, Shay Ajib, right? Yeah. Because Allah. you bring bring up one of these sects. Luckily, we didn't bring up the Qadianis. They, because they sit around waiting for someone to say their name because <laughs> that's what it seems like. And then they get obsessed with that person for for a week until they find someone else. Okay, <laughs> were the twelve munafiks considered companions? The question says. Here is the question: Are they companions who are munafiks, or is a munafik and a companion completely different? I mean, the based on the discussion that we had, they're completely different. This completely different. Tabayun. Yeah, it's tabayun. I mean, it's completely distinct concepts. Good. Yeah. Okay. Next question: What do you consider more dangerous a, a liberal wayward muslim or a pious deviant scholar <laughs> <laughs> how do you measure that shit how do you yeah. measure that? subhanallah i would say i'd have to say the pious with deviation has is dangerous in one area, which is the rational, the, the beliefs. The liberal wayward person is dangerous for the sins of the outside, the external sins. But Sheikh, I just... Tafsir. Just want, but, but do they mean liberal by liberal, meaning their actions or liberal in their theology? No, uh, nothing to do with the deen. Someone, nothing to do with the deen... And he's a leader, for example. He's like a leader of the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. but Or but, somebody who is a pious, masjid-going person, but he has deviations. Because if they're liberal, for example, liberal, they're like liberalism. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's like a theology, isn't it? Yep, it is. It's so, a very dangerous one. It's very dangerous. So. Worse. It's worse than these sects. Yeah. So that's your answer, folks. If you're talking about liberal just as in someone who listens to music and hangs out with girls is different from someone who knows what liberalism is and believes in it and puts it out there, he's almost at that point like a neo mautazili Yeah. Or worse. I would say worse than Mu'tazili. Worse than them. Mu'tazili were, were, were scholars of Qur'an and fiqh. Uqala. Mm. And they were uqala and they were 
muttaqin in the in their you know they had taqwa they had ibadah etc okay what's the question there how do you check your sincerity we talked about how, uh, hmm? when, people know about when people discover your work let's say for example somebody um, does some kind of work that becomes known to the people maybe, maybe uh, in the deen or the dunya how do they keep their sincerity in check so I think uh, I heard one of our teachers saying that when you hear something good or somebody praises you or, or you, you realize your work is being accepted the first thing you need to do is praise Allah and negate yourself. Subhanallah. You neg- first, Alhamdulillah. This is all, uh, all Allah's fadl. Wa ma illa billah. And then you negate yourself. That, you know, it's not me. You know, just uh, just to use uh, Khabib, you know, the... Yeah, the fighter. Yep. <laughs> oh, no. That's what he does, right? Subhanallah. Yeah. Me, no. That's- yep. Yeah. He's, he's negating himself despite being a champion. He's negating himself. Subhanallah. So negating yourself is very important because when you once you start believing that you are that person, that's when the problem begins. It's amazing how you said that. Just earlier, I was there was a meeting, there was a mm. business meeting, mm. and it went so well, and they closed the deal. So the leader of this Muslim group that was closed the deal, he stood up. And what people didn't expect, he said, all this success is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not from us. And he could have used anybody else to do this. But he chose us for a reason. So we should be thankful and we should be grateful. So I felt like that is a true Muslim businessman, right? That's like a great example. This person is a great example of how to succeed when you're a Muslim businessman. Uh, a business, so uh, you you close a the deal. They take out bottles, right, and they co- uh, uncork the bottles. That's what they do. That's the orf, orf mulga. But uh, this, he stood up and he negated himself and he praised Allah and he said it could have been anybody else, right, been chosen to do this kind of work. Allah. Allah. Um, all right, we kept you on for an hour, pretty much mm-hmm. almost an hour. Um, Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much. Any next topic that comes around, in the light, I will have you back on. In the uh, any final words that you'd like to say to the nasiha amma to the to the audience? Uh, what can I say? Uh, I think uh, maybe it's something that just comes uh, spontaneously comes to my mind now. With something, uh, something that you mentioned, you know, what was happening with uh, uh, Gaza and Palestine? Uh, we are all in pain, and uh, we are all making dua for them, and we are trying to create much as aware, uh, much awareness as possible. But with that, uh, my advice, humble advice to myself would be, and everybody else, that we should not forget our own selves. Where are we going? Uh, this massacre that we are seeing and this genocide is unfolding before our own eyes. If I'm not changing, if I'm not doing tawbah, if I'm not getting closer to Allah, if I'm not stopping, uh, you know, sins, then this is something that should worry me. That a massacre and a genocide is not changing my life. The only thing that will change my life next is my own death. But that's too late. SubhanAllah. So I think in what was happening globally, we should not forget our own selves and our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, if I've said anything in here that's beneficial, it's tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Allah. And if I've said anything that's incorrect, or if I've offended anybody in any way, I do apologize. And uh, that was from shaitan and my nafs. And Dr. Sheikh Shad al-Masri, I want to say special jazakum Allah khair and barakallahu feekum wa bikum to you. I mean, wa iyaakum, wa iyaakum, wa iyaakum. Allah ta'ala protect you, preserve you, accept all your efforts. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep your shade over us for a very, very long time, inshallah. I mean, I mean, and likewise yourself, and may Allah ta'ala grant us your suhba for a very long time to come. And uh, constantly and always our hearts are connected. Uh, may Allah keep it that way. Uh, we're so happy to come on. Uh, you don't see, but we have a full house studio here. Oh, my right? salam. Right, have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And now the pizza has arrived. So 12 brothers came 
uh, when they knew that you're coming on. That's live. And uh, on the f- between no, Facebook. No. Sheikh, they didn't come for me. They came for your Hanka. No, that's <laughs> all. <laughs> Allah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair and we'll be looking forward to have you on regularly, inshallah. Jazakallah khair and so much. Thank you. Wa alaikum as Wa alaikum as wa There you have it, my brothers and sisters. That was Sheikh Muhammad Yasser Al Hanafi. I remember very, very well that evening or that day, sorry, that day in which we met for the first time and he elaborated on this thesis of uh, the proof of the attributes of uh, uh, believers in the Qur'an, the attributes of the companion in the Qur'an that fit directly with Abu Bakr and Umar and Aisha, right? that they cannot possibly be hypocrites. Okay, So it's an amazing uh, talk. And then this is years later that um, we're able to share it with everybody here. Um, in other news, you all know that the... Uh, Catholic Church has basically bas- gamed over themselves. Game over. As soon as I saw it, you know what came to mind, which is very weird because the retro era that we're living in, Mario Brothers, when you game over and you fall into the uh, the very first Mario Brothers, right? When you, you, By the way, you can play that. You can still play it on the computer for free. It's uh, uploaded. Um, he's running. And if you fall into the, uh, like the, the pot, you go down into a black hole, right? And then he goes belly up and it says game over, right? There you go. <laughs> Did you all hear that? Okay. Play it. Yeah, play it. That's it, Mary. It's all you're over. You're finished with. And that to me was the uh um This is it. Yeah. Play it. Play the sound so everyone hears and knows what I'm talking about. This was my favorite game. It still is. Where is the uh, Where is the sound? Not. Oh, okay. That little. That's music. Uh, that little sound effect when he falls into the pot. Right. That's it. He, he's dead. Okay. Nintendo sixty four. No. Nintendo zero zero one. The very first Nintendo. Do 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 do. Finished. There it is. I used to play that game. It was the only game I had. It was the only game that existed. You know, there was a time when there was Atari. So Habe knows this. Atari, ping pong. Ping pong was like 10 pixels this way, 10 pixels this way, and one pixel in the middle. And you just play ping pong back and forth. That was, alas, if you had that, we spent all night in your basement. Then they came out with Nintendo, the very first Nintendo, big box like this with one slit in it. That's it. And it came with one game. Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. Nobody played Duck Hunt. You played Mario Brothers. That gun it never worked, right? <laughs> uh, and then to buy a game was like 60 bucks back in the day. It was a huge amount of money to buy a game. And they would come out with one game a year, right? So you played Mario Brothers. All day and all night you played Mario Brothers. Then somebody, I don't know who discovered, there was a, a warp zone that when you that there's a certain pot you can go down and you immediately jump three levels. Okay. That's how we used to have fun back in the day. And and nobody knew about this pot. I think someone must have discovered it by accident. And that was news. That was big news. That was like uh, the, if, the dark web, right? <laughs> you went to school and you told everybody, listen, at this level, if you pass this, you jump into that pot, go down it, you're not going to die. You're going to jump three levels, Right. And that was big news. Let's close off with uh, dua. By the way, what's our schedule? This only, uh, this this week is our last week, then we have Umrah. Umrah for youth. We're going now, we're taking 22 youth and 18 adults. Okay. What does that say? What does it say? Agnes Maverick. The scholars of Ahlul Sunnah twist the Quran too. If that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have sex. Like Hamdi Hanbi Maliki Shafi said, "That's not sex. They are in agreement on the foundational qat'i 
explicit, unequivocal verses. They then interpret what should be interpreted, must be interpreted, which are unequivocal dhanni verses. And the sunnah agree on the qat'i verses. Okay, No two people disagree, like the trunk of the tree. But once you pass a certain level, the, they branch out. What is that branching out is? Differences where different opinions are inevitable or belong by Allah's command and will that ayat are equivocal. They could mean two different things. Okay? Or they do require definition. Okay? So that's it's extremely important to understand what is the difference between an opinion, a school of thought, and a sect. A sect breaks away from explicit verses, qat'i verses. A school of thought is an interpretation of equivocal, inexplicit dhanni verses. That is a big difference in theology that you must understand. Sometimes I feel like I say it every single stream. I don't care, I'll keep saying it, right? It may not be a concept that people grasp. A sect differs on where there is no difference allowed. That's why they're a sect to be banished. A school of thought differs where difference is allowed. Okay? And an erroneous group gives an interpretation where interpretation is allowed, but it's an incorrect interpretation. Okay? That's what we just call them. They're in a mistake. They're, they're just making a mistake. But they're not outside Ahl Sunnah. I don't feel sometimes I uh, say it, but I guess we'll just keep doing it again. We'll just keep saying it. 20th time and it probably will be 200 times because there you know there was a guy in New York he won there was a woman in New York City she won teacher of the year 30 times in her career how, how long is a career like 40 years she won it 30 times so they asked her how do you keep uh, uh, how, what mentality is it what is it that you keep being such a good teacher okay but you're teaching the same grade for 40 years, 30 of those years, you're teacher of the year. She said such a wise statement. She said, because for me, it may be the 30th time I've taught it, but for my students, every year it's their first time. And that's what we have to keep in mind. The selfish person who said, I said it 30 times. Okay, but that's their first time, right? So what happens when you have a new baby, a fifth baby, you're not going to potty train him? <laughs> Right, <laughs> I taught five babies how to wear underwear and be potty trained. Or I'm not doing this anymore. Right, you have to do it, whether you like it or not. Are you going to now do it in a bad mood? You're just going to put yourself in a bad mood. Not every day we're going to let's go, let's flush the toilet, let's watch it go around. Right, you have to, because you're shortchanging their childhood at that point if you don't do that, and you're in a bad mood. Well, let's go learn this already so we can move on. Right, I don't know. What's that? A little, personal, a little bit too. <laughs> what do they call that? Too much information? Yeah. <laughs> right. TMI. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Jazakumullah khairan. Let's close out with Dua and Noor. Let's pull it up from our book here. Uh, but it's a bit small, so I just pull it up from my iPad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم اجعلني نورا في قلبي ونورا في قبري ونورا في سمعي ونورا في بصري ونورا في شعري ونورا في بشري ونورا في لحمي ونورا في دمي ونورا في عظامي ونورا في عصبي ونورا من بين يدي ونورا من خلفي ونورا عن يميني ونورا عن شمالي ونورا من فوقي ونورا من تحتي اللهم زدني نورا واجعل لي نورا وأعطني نورا واجعل لي نورا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين